briefly when you all got up, I thought you wanted to walk out. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, uh, Father uh, Pavonka, for your kind words of introduction. It gave me a sense already, uh, if I live well and I think about my beatification, I know some who can be witnesses to that, <laughs> and they'll have some things to say. But very, very grateful to you for this invitation to be part of this, of this retreat. If I had known about this as a retreat the way I know now, I probably would have, uh, you know, subscribed to it myself and registered for it. But I'm glad also to have been invited. Yes, as uh, Father said, I have been on this campus before. Uh, and that was with Father Scannon, at one point with the Renewal Ministries, whom some of you may know, and uh, was to do ministry here. Part of it was with a charismatic renewal. And then, and then, and then, you know, uh, everything happened. And being in Rome, there's a little bit less time to to travel a lot with the with the movement. But I'm glad for this invitation, and I'm just hoping that. My sharing would prove, you know, uh, will, will make you all come in and you'll stay here very useful. And I hope it will not be anything that will cause you regret. And since this is about you all had your dinner, I also hope that there will be no indigestion caused to anybody from, from, from what I'll be, I'll be saying to you. So I have been invited to talk about disunity. This unity, of course, in the context that has just been presented to us about unity in the Holy Spirit and how we all invited to live this unity in the Holy Spirit. But invite us specifically to look at this unity in the world, in the church, and how we can find solutions to this unity only in God I like this afternoon, uh, in my small sharing, brief sharing with you, to look at the issue of disunity, contrast it with unity, and see the big forms of disunity in our world and in our church, and try to suggest a way of looking at disunity in a way that it can be useful and it can be profitable in the sense that we can find in Christ Jesus the key to resolving this unity and living in unity. And so, my dear friends, when one Nigerian author decided to face the challenges of modernity in his native land in Nigeria, he took a quote from the English poet William Yeats and said, turning and turning in the widening guile, the falcon cannot hear the falconer anymore, things fall apart, and mere anarchy is loose upon the earth. Yes, things do fall apart when the center cannot hold. And when the center cannot hold, then there is really no unity. And when there's no unity and this unity takes over, then everything crumbles, everything falls apart. This is not just a situation of somebody in Nigeria facing the challenges of modernity, but this incidentally is also a very common characteristic of our human history, this unity. Very many of us look at the book of Genesis and we interpret that as God having created everything established humanity as one common human family. And so, a crucial characteristic of the human family is its unity, unity in God, the Father, and God, the Creator. But then as you notice shortly thereafter, the scriptures which affirm the central unity of God and everything that God created, pretty soon begins to talk about separation disunities, and breaks up. So God who created everything in unity then calls only Abraham. 
and leaves the rest. And calls Abraham and makes him, gives him a mission. Then from the children of Abraham, Isaac will be picked up. And the rest will be left. And then Jacob is picked up. Isaac, so the, all these separations, as it were, introduce a series of uh, disunities in the way God works our salvation. And that's just what I want to focus on and see again in the same scriptures what kind of solution we can find in solving these uni this unities which characterize the path of our salvation. And we will not be the only ones to have an issue with the disunities in scriptures. It's already an observation that was made in antiquity in Greeks, the Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, struggled with the same idea. And indeed, at one point, while they affirmed God as the common creator of everybody, we'll still go ahead and say, but the barbarians are not the same as the Greeks. And so there, there is a difference. And then Plato would say, the pious and the holy people are not the same as the wicked and on their unrighteous people. So invariably, it's as if humanity is always caught up in the tendency to always create separation, disunite, and create groups within its system. That is not only the case. In looking at this feature then this evening, I like, I like to do something very simple and something very basic using a method that I suppose is known to very many of us. It's a method that was made popular in the church by a Belgian cardinal called Joseph Leon Cardin. It is a popular method about see, judge, and act. So I like to see the phenomenon of this unity in the world and in the church. Then I'll try to evaluate this phenomenon, this unity in the church and in the world, in the light of scripture. And from that, I try to draw some conclusions about how we can deal with this unity, how this unity enables us to appreciate God's plan of salvation in the world and in our lives. And so this unity in the world and around us, it's everywhere. It's politically motivated. It's ideologically motivated. It's motivated by new waves of nationalism in Europe. It is motivated by new trends of emerging nationhood. And it's motivated by several factors. Presently in Europe, the biggest concern for the European Union is not its membership, but their emerging sense of nationalism of groups wanting to emphasize on their national identity to the disregard of others. This is a challenge politically motivated and sometimes supported by very vigorous ideological currents. It is a form of disunity, a form of disunity of the human race. Another tendency that we face very often and commonly in our world is also there's this unity that is uh, brought forth by the emergence of different states and the reference to them even in scripture. Plato would already say that there is no way that the Greek is like the barbarian, or neither is the German like the Italian, or the French like the Slovakian, and so forth. So the differentiations are there, the disunions are created. But when we bring them to scripture and try to understand this feature, then we find out that before we start looking at what scripture, what help scripture can provide us with in understanding this feature, we within our own ranks as Christians can also describe several crucial periods of disunity and separations. In the Old Testament, why did God's people become Samaritans and Jews? They used to be one people. By the rule of Jeroboam and his political hubris led them to the creation of the north. 
And when Assyria did attack in 721 and mixed the population with foreigners, the Jews in the south or the people of Judah considered the north as unclean and not worthy anymore to be considered Jews. And so Jews and Samaritans evolved. Till the day of Jesus, we recognize how irreconcilable the tension and the divisions were. Beyond this division in the Old Testament, a very small minor one also did occur when some Jews migrated to Alexandria in the Babylonian exile, and so part of them was left there as opposed to the Jews in Palestine, another situation of disunity and separation. But in our own day in the Christian church, we recognize a big separation that took place between the Roman Catholic Church, the Western and the Eastern Church, the great schism of 1091. That has led to the present day division between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Such a separation is so crucial because it means that between the two communions or the two churches, communion is now difficult to describe and to fashion. We know what Pope Francis is doing with Pope uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, but the division and is still there. Another big division within the Christian church was the thing about the Reformation. Again, a big division within the Christian church, a big, a big instance of disunity, which led to a splintering of several other divisions within the Christian community to what we have today. Again, efforts are being made to heal such divisions. Then finally, we can talk about current present-day division like the threat of another schism in the Lefebvre movement that is coming up strong within the church again. Uh, the Holy Father, the Pope Francis, is dealing gingerly with the situation, but the threat is still there. And now to talk about old Catholics here and there. In a very local level, we can also talk about several divisions in the church. I mean, when news about four cardinals dissenting from the Pope's encyclical on later Amore Letizia, that also suggests to people that there is division. Or when the Pope comes out with a teaching and then some theologians have reason to dissent, the impression also given out is that there is division also within the church. Or where in any bishop's conference, there's position, the common position has some dissenting voice among other members of the conference. Still, there is a talk about disunity in the church. So it is with us in several cases and several ways, to the point that it can also become a personal experience of each one of us. When distractions tear us apart so that it's difficult for us to, 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 to kind of concentrate and bring our own resources together to be able to pray, then we also talk about disunited and torn at the heart and within our own souls. So disunity is a very common phenomenon and common feature with us. And so how may we deal with it or how can we deal with it? My dear friends, it's like this. I like to suggest three steps. Several things in human history follow the same dynamics with which Jesus settled and answer the question in the Old Testament about marriage. We can describe the, the phase when God created everything. Then we can describe an era or a period when it was dominated by sin and curses. And then we can describe a final phase of everything being redeemed in Christ. And that is also the situation with this unity and division and separation in our world and in the church. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, everything there is created assuming there's a unity of everything. Unity in three ways. The one God, the creator of heaven and earth, is the father of all. Two, this God created, created humanity in his own image and likeness, endowing on them all common dignity. So that when he created man and woman and brought them together to generate their own species and kind, the one thing that they always had to transmit was the dignity of the human person by reason of the fact that they all created in the image and the likeness of God. When later on with the birth of brothers, Cain and Abel, 
we have a diversity. This diversity still could not obliterate and do away with the common quality that they all have of being all created in the image and likeness of God. So in brotherhood, we are invited to, re to reconcile diversity with unity. Sharing the same image and likeness of God, brothers still are different. So diversity in itself is not opposed to unity. Brotherhood is a signal of that. Two brothers are not the same, although they come from the same womb. That's why the Greek will call them Adelphos, from the same womb. And imagine from the same womb, they have the same dignity, they have the same character. So they, that also makes them, uh, makes them one before, before, before God. And then when God decided to place the first human beings he's created in the garden, again, he ensured that these would also work the garden in a sense of unity, solidarity. So the common sense that we get about God and the human race in the first 11 chapters of scriptures is its unity. But the unity that was quickly destroyed by the incidence of sin and then five-fold curses. The first two curses were given to serpent and given to Adam and the, and the land on which he had to farm. The third curse was given to Cain when he shed his blood as broad. And God said, curse be the earth on account of the blood, blood of your brother that it is swallowed. The fourth curse would be when Ham or Canaan they went to you know, discover his father naked and came to tell the brothers to laugh at him. And so there, the brother, waking from the stupor of wine that he had drunk, then imposed a curse on Canaan and his brother and his children. And the fifth curse to be inferred was at the Tower of Babel, when again humanity was scattered in different languages and different kinds. So the unity that characterized creation was dismantled by sin and curses. Till again, God steps in to save the situation, and he saves the situation by the call of Abraham. If before the call of Abraham, the world had been dominated by five curses, the call of Abraham is dominated by five blessings. Five times did God mention blessing when he calls Abraham. As if in the call of Abraham, God was overturning everything that had, been, that had gone wrong in the beginning. And so that is one separation. But it's a separation that is meant to create the unity of the rest. Because when Abraham is called in that separation, then he's told, in you all the families of the earth shall find blessing. So this is a separation with difference. It's a separation that leads to reintegration. The blessing of all of humanity in Abraham. And this logic continues all through scripture till it comes to fulfillment in Christ Jesus, in whom all of humanity is brought together again. So the series of separations that, the series of disunities that we see in scripture all become disunities which God makes use of to refashion the unity that must characterize the human race. It's a disunity with the scope, disunity with view to refashioning the unity of the human race. So there's these unities we find in scripture with the choice of the 12 apostles from the rest of humanity. Jesus tells us that he preaches in parables, but in private he would explain it to his 12 apostles. Another disunity. But this is done so that the 12 apostles will become the bearers of message for the rest of humanity. So in the scriptures, we witness a series of disunities or disruptions which are ultimately meant to refashion and to create a unity that must belong to all of us. So that's how God works. He restores the unity of the human race and unity of all of humankind. And this is the crucial and the concrete way God does this work of unity. At this point, I think I'm going to be leaking to you a little bit of uh, 
a small, a small subject matter I worked on in the past as a thesis. And it is this. Bear for your attention just uh, briefly. An American and a Ghanaian, we are fundamentally opposed. An American cannot be a Ghanaian, a Ghanaian cannot be an American, right? A Jew, okay, an Israelite, a non-Israelite are fundamentally opposed. A non-Israelite and an Israelite cannot, you know, swap positions. So an Israelite and an Ammonite or Gibeonite or Amalekite or Babylonian, these all stand in fundamental opposition. And God did that by making Israel his people, choosing Abraham, uh, Abraham and his children. But God doesn't leave Israel in this fundamental opposition because God then decided to call Israel my people the people of Yahweh. The moment God calls Israel people of Yahweh, the, the, the tension and the opposition is mitigated. It just means that since Israel's identity now is based on the fact that it's a, a, a people of God, whenever God will decide to make any other group his people, there is therefore the possibility of coming together. This is the logic of God. Israel was separated at one point, but once God made Israel his people, any other nation that God will make his people means that they can now relate with Israel. The fundamental opposition is then removed. And this is what has happened. In God calling all the humanity, all the races on earth, his people, and making this come to pass through Jesus' his death and on the, on the, on the cross, God has removed all the fundamental oppositions that separate humanity. That's why Paul in his letter to the Galatians will say, in Christ Jesus, there's no more the Greek or the Hebrew, or slave or free man. Because in God calling all of us his people, there are no fundamental oppositions anymore. The unity of the human race is reestablished. And it's reestablished in Christ Jesus. And he shares this with us, in the power of his own Holy Spirit. So rebirth in Jesus now has become a way of becoming God's people. And in becoming God's people then, the disunity and the obstacles that existed between the human race, it's all, it's, it's all taken away. They all crumble at the prospect of being God's people. And so the unity of human race and nature is restored. And it is stored in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the death and the resurrection of Christ. So Jesus would say he's the firstborn of many brothers. He's now the firstborn of many brothers. And through the spirit that he bestows on others, others are then made, you know, his own brothers, making them his people and fashioning the unity that characterizes us as God's people. And so, when Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, He's hesitant about opening up to Cornelius, thinking still that this is a Jew and a non-Jew. Until God, you know, takes, takes the lead and makes the Holy Spirit pour on Cornelius and his elder, and then Peter said, if the Lord himself has taken the lead, yes, that's what the Lord has done. The Lord has shown Peter that it's no more a question of Jews and non-Jews, Greeks and non-Greeks. It's not a question of being people of God. And when we are people of God in the Holy Spirit, the unity of the human family as God's creation is restored, is refashioned. And that's why we gather to celebrate the unity that God has fashioned out of all of us in the power of the Holy Spirit. No more because of our particular identities and particular origins and particular races, but by the reason of the fact that in Christ Jesus, the firstborn of very many brothers, all of us in becoming children of God are now invited to a life of communion, a life of unity, which was the design of God right from the beginning of creation. So the unity, we, we gathered here this uh, next few days to reflect upon, is, is established this way. 
It's a unity that recognizes the fact that we're all different from different places, but it's a unity that is established because the Lord invites us to first become his people. And in becoming his people, it doesn't then matter what fundamental oppositions we used to live in. All of those oppositions crumble, and in Christ Jesus, we become, like it said, you know, brothers and sisters. All brothers and sisters in Christ, the first one of very many brothers in the power of the Holy Spirit. So it is my own prayer for you this next uh, a few days in your meeting and pray over here that you'll discover what you have or we have all become in the Holy Spirit. The new brotherhood that has been fashioned for us in the Holy Spirit and the new unity of being children of God that has been fashioned for us. If God at the dawn of creation created us as one family, sin and curses disrupted the design and plan of God. God did not abandon us, but picking and separating us, if he was dividing us or more, he created a pathway again for refashioning us into the family of God. And that is ultimately what Christ has come to do for us. It is no more Israelite, but Israel as people of God. And when Israel is a people of God, then anybody else whom God makes his, uh, his people then can come into relationship with Israel. That is our salvation. And that's how the promises made to Abraham come to all of us and reach us. So my prayer is that this unity that we celebrate in the Holy Spirit these next few days will be a unity that will inspire and kind of inspire all of us to discover the personal unities that we must all discover within our own lives. In Christ Jesus, everything has been reconciled with the Father. And that includes the very many differences that exist in our lives. So my prayer for all of you, may your three or four days over here be one, enlightened and strengthened by the God and His Holy Spirit, so we discover the path to unity in His church, in the world, and in the life of each one of us. Thank you.